Heals welcomes you to the third Euro Symposium on Healthy Aging. Heals is the largest non-governmental organization in Europe promoting and advocating scientific research into longevity and biogerontology. Thanks to generous support from our sponsors, Heals was able to organize this conference. The conference will highlight the cutting edge of knowledge in the field of biogerontology and provide a unique opportunity for researchers, government officials, biotech executives and advocates from around the world to meet, network and forge new scientific collaborations. Morning, thanks very much for inviting me to this. Um, just to introduce my group a little bit, I uh, run a group in Exeter, but I've recently been spending three months a year at the University of Connecticut working with the new Jackson Laboratory for Genomic Medicine, which is a, a very exciting initiative there. Um, we really do uh, genomic and conventional epidemiology of human aging. We've published a series of transcriptome-wide association studies on age itself and on IL-6 inflammatory levels and so on, uh, with some lab follow-ups, especially of splicing and changes in the splicing machinery with age. Uh, but more recently, we've been uh, taking advantage of some wonderful big, big sample genome-wide association study resources and very big electronic medical record resources on aging. So all of you will probably know that the offspring of centenarians and nonagenarians uh, age uh, in a much more gradual way and tend to delay the diseases of aging to much later in life. So uh, we noticed that in the health and retirement study in the US, they'd asked about the age of parents, and we were able to look at about 6,000 people followed for 18 years. And here we plot the relative mortality by the age at which mothers died. And as you can see, before about age 65, 70, there's not much difference. But after that, there's an extraordinary pretty well linear reduction in mortality rates per decade that your mother lives beyond about 70. There's a 19% reduction in mortality in the offspring, about 14% for fathers. Those two pretty well add up arithmetically. And what was really interesting was when we looked at these people's cognitive decline, they were serial measures of cognitive function as well as dementia diagnoses. Uh, these folks had slower rates of cognitive decline during the follow-up and also they had fewer dementia diagnoses. So uh, having long-lived parents seems to involve some real advantage in aging. Uh, what was uh, very intriguing though was we didn't find any evidence of a special effect at the top end of the age range. So the offspring of nonagenarians or centenarians seemed to be pretty well part of the linear trait. There was no sp something special going on at the top end. Now, uh, we noticed a really great opportunity to take this forward in the UK Biobank. This is a volunteer study of 500,000 participants from 22 assessment centres across the UK. Uh, they were aged 40 to, they were supposed to be 69, but some 70 and 70, up to 73 year olds actually got in. There was a pretty extensive physical examination and questionnaire baseline and blood, uh, blood draws. We're still waiting for some of the blood tests to come back. And these people are being followed up with our national death registration system and our national health service hospital records. And uh, gene inherited variants, the SNP variants, genetic variants, have been uh, determined for all 500,000 now, but only the first third of that has been released. So what I'm going to present is kind of a pilot study 
Stockholm, about 75,000 people aged 55 to 70. Obviously, the younger ones, their parents are too young to look at parental longevity. They uh, uh, aren't old enough to be uh, in the normal aging range. Um, the chips used are Affymetrix chips, 820,000 SNPs directly genotyped, 9 million imputed. And in addition to looking at individual genetic variants, uh, we looked at the cumulative effect of the known variation uh, for things like coronary artery disease and LDL, lipids, uh, low-density lipoprotein, cholesterol, and so on. So what we did was we found the latest report of uh, which SNPs are very robustly associated with these traits. And for each participant, we added up the number of bad alleles and we weighted that score by the effect size of that gene. And this is what we found for the single variant GWAS. So this is looking right across the genome. Our top hit came out for father's age of death in the nicotine receptor. And uh, you might think that's disappointing, but actually it's a real proof of principle. Uh, smoking is the most uh, important behavioral determinant of longevity, obviously, and to pick up this known variant, which is associated with it being more difficult to give up smoking. These folks aren't more likely to take up smoking, but once they start smoking, they're more hooked. They, they become more dependent on nicotine. And this is a very well-known variant, so it's pretty exciting and a proof of principle that we were able to detect that a genome-wide significance of P of less than p times f five times ten to the minus eight, so very very tight uh, significance. Well, one of the other really exciting single markers uh, came out for extreme longevity. This is a group of people whose mothers or fathers were in the top one percent of survival. These were actually fathers who were over uh, ninety-five or mothers who were over 98 when they died. In other words, a lot more stringent than the other GWASs, which have just focused on 90 and over. And uh, one of the markers at genome-wide significance was this one, uh, which is associated with DNA repair. Uh, we need more work. We're going to get the other two-thirds of the data very soon. So uh, this, uh, we'll be able to see whether this is a really robust finding or not. But uh, just as interesting, was the effect of known uh, SNPs, known genetic variants, on traits that are related to aging. So, for example, uh, those scores I talked about for coronary artery disease, there are 53 gene variants known, and we added them up, them up and weighted them, and per allele, uh, per score, we find that coronary artery disease was associated, uh, sorry, that, that offspring of long-lived parents had far fewer bad coronary artery disease genes. They had a lower genetic risk for coronary artery disease. They had a lower genetic risk for low-density lipoproteins, the, the bad cholesterol. Uh, for high-density lipoproteins overall, um, the genes involved in that raise high-density lipoprotein. That's a good thing, so the estimate was on the other side, but uh, it didn't quite reach significance. As you see, they also tended to have less genetic risk for triglycerides, for systolic blood pressure, and for body mass index, obesity. And I'll come back to obesity because I think that's really important for the future of aging, at least in Western countries. Uh, we also found quite a few associations with autoimmune conditions. Inflammatory bowel disease, near significant for Crohn's disease, uh, one for type 1 diabetes, and also for Alzheimer's disease scores. So there was a set of publications early on in GWAS that claimed that these common disease genes didn't affect uh, longevity. longevity. Um, but actually, we find in this very big sample that they definitely do. Now, we also looked at that extreme longevity estimate. These, again, are uh, mothers aged over 98, 
98 or over, father's 95 or over. And what was really interesting is that HDL, the good cholesterol, H high density lipoprotein, genetic load was now highly significant. So it looks as if in order to become, uh, to get into that top 1% of longevity, it's very helpful to have high levels of HDL cholesterol, which would fit with a lot of the observational um, data. Now, obviously, it's very intriguing that uh, variants for smoking and lipids and obesity should come up. So we began to look a little bit more at the baseline characteristics of these children of long-lived parents. And we divided them into uh, both their parents were short-lived, that is, more than one standard deviation below the mode of age of death, or one standard deviation above. And you look at the differences between people who had two short-lived parents versus two long-lived parents. So smoking status, 8% in the short-lived, 4% in the long-lived. Physical activity, big trend, education, enormous trend. So the proportion of long-lived offspring who had no educational qualification was only 14%. But 31, nearly 32% in the short lived. And obesity, 18% in the long lived offspring, 30% in the short lived offspring. Um, <clears throat> so the obvious next thing to do was well, what are the cumulative effects of these uh, known cardiovascular risk factors? So uh, we followed a little schema by the American Heart Association, the so-called Life Simple 7 uh, risk factors. And we try to code them up, uh, covering smoking, physical activity, cholesterol, glucose, uh, blood pressure, and body mass index. And did a score, and here, this is what we see when we look at the offspring themselves in Biobank. This is 181,000 people aged 60 and over. If you look at the people who had poor cardiovascular risks, they were almost three times more likely to fit the freed frailty criteria. That is having weight loss, two, uh, two of the features of weight loss, exhaustion, slow walking speed, or low grip strength. 12.8% versus 4.4% in the people with ideal cardiovascular risks. And look at chronic pain. I mean, that chronic pain is a huge problem in older people nearly half of those with poor risks reporting chronic pain, 37% of those were the best risks. Only about, the tragedy of this is only about 9% of the sample were actually at the top, at the best end of cardiovascular risks. Now, one thing you might say is, uh, but hold on a minute, uh, you're talking about being overweight being a bad thing, but there have been a whole series of papers in really good journals, like the Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA, claiming that in old people, being overweight or obese is actually a good thing or makes no difference. Um, and uh, yeah, a whole series of big studies of older people showing this. And uh, this appeared in Nature of all places suggesting that public health researchers were kind of hiding this information, that being overweight was not always, would not always shorten your life. Now, this is a big problem for people like us who believe in calorie restriction uh, being associated with longevity. I mean, if this is true, then maybe our mouse models of uh, lowering adiposity as low as possible are actually doing the opposite of what we should be doing. And of course, our brilliant press in the UK uh, has been carrying these kind of reports. Uh, there's a GP going around saying that uh, medicine has got the definitions of things like obesity completely wrong and that uh, people should aim to be overweight, what we call overweight in old age. Well, uh, we've got a wonderful electronic medical record system in the UK, uh, which are, at the moment has 13 million people registered in it. It's expanding rapidly, 
but it links together the computers that sit on GPs' desks, the actual clinical computers that they do their actual uh, medical records on. It links that to hospital episodes in, in our NHS hospitals. It links it to death certificates. And the GP records are very detailed. And the GPs were paid to collect data on things like obesity uh, a few years ago. And we were able to uh, analyze the records of 955,000 patients, very population representative, including people in nursing homes and residential homes. And these are the data for 65 to 69 year olds. And it shows exactly what our terrible newspapers are saying, that if you look at all older people together, and you compare them to the WHO normal uh, category for BMI, 18 and a half to 25, the people at highest risk are underweight, but the overweight and mildly obese older people, 65 to 69, are actually doing better. They actually have lower mortality than the so-called normal. And we started thinking about this and wondering how it could be that genetically BMI raising risk, BMI genes, genes that increase your BMI should be associated with long-lived parents, but observationally it looks the opposite. And the explanation is very simple, of course. You really have to separate out those older people who have already got serious disease. So when you take out people who've already got dementia, recent cancer, heart failure, or high levels of morbidity, this is six or more conditions. And also you've got to take out smokers. Smokers tend to be lean, but of course they have very high mortality. And you can't deal with these problems by our simple statistical adjustment because they are, uh, they are beyond confounding. They are collider effects. They work in the opposite direction. If you separate them out, uh, and you look at the healthier ages separately, that is, the blue ones, you see that compared to the normal, there isn't much difference with overweight, but the obese people are clearly having higher mortality. So healthier ages who are obese clearly have higher mortality. We looked a bit more at the normal group, and there are two problems. One is that BMI is very bad at measuring central obesity. It doesn't measure uh, central obesity. If you account for central obesity, then overweight becomes uh, a risk factor for mortality. And also, the current classification down to 18.5 on BMI is much too broad and is inclu including a whole lot of people with very low weights associated with serious disease. Now, these problems are not just with existing disease. Some of these diseases will be associated with weight loss for many years before they're diagnosed. And so um, these problems of, of developing disease that's not yet diagnosed really mess up these associations. But we really have to worry about the global epidemic of obesity as far as the future of healthy aging is concerned. So uh, what are our conclusions? The mechanism explaining longer-lived parent effects in humans, which is one of our best models in humans of slowed aging, include multiple protective slash risk factors, including common genetic risks for common diseases, including healthy lifestyle, and maybe including some exciting new genetic variants involved in DNA repair and other pathways, we'll soon be able to replicate those. Optimum, optimum multiple life, lifestyle factors are very important for healthy aging. We can have very big impacts on frailty and chronic pain and similar measures right now, and we really need to get over this claimed obese, obesity paradox. It is not a real finding. Obesity is bad. The calorie restriction experiments in animals are a good model in humans. And uh, what's exciting about this model is that many of the pathways we already have interventions for. We already have good interventions to control high blood pressure and cholesterol levels and so on. 
The tragedy is older people are often excluded from the trials. So for example, the oldest person ever in a statin trial was 81. There's hardly any evidence for statins in older people. Um, and many of our older people are far from optimal risks. In the UK, only I think it's 60% of the population of the older population is overweight or obese. So thanks very much. This is the work of an enormous group of people. UK Biobank is a fantastic national and international resource. This work was fu uh, funded by the UK Medical Research Council. And we have collaborators stretching from India, uh, France, and to the US. So thanks very much. <laughs> Any questions? You said um, uh, overweight, you know, aging. Is it media stopping to publish or academic or who? They say the government trying not to hide it, you know, people be overweight or not overweight. Or oh, well, the paper, the uh, report in Nature said mm. that public health officials were hiding the, the fact, fact that being overweight was good for you that they were leaving the public to believe obesity was a really bad thing when actually it was good for you in old age. Why? Uh, well, the, um, it turned out that some of the people being who've been publishing on the protective effects of obesity in old age were funded by Coca-Cola Corporation and other corporations. So uh, it's not simple science going on here. There's a big political agenda around sugar and so on that is uh, trying to make out that obesity isn't that bad. But really, if you look at the genetic evidence, of course, you get the genetic variants at birth. They're not influenced by confounding. They're not influenced by the effects of disease. They're the best indication that having genetic risk of increased obesity is bad for you. And excitingly, it's just been reported that Genetic risk isn't associated with your ability to lose weight. If you try and lose weight, those genes don't make much difference to whether you can lose weight or not. <laughs>